Thank you so much. And hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation from OLS. Um, and thank you for listening to this uh, presentation I have about diversity and inclusion. I'm just going to share my screen very quickly. Uh, so I'm going to fiddle with the controls for just a moment. So please bear with me. Um, there we go. Can everybody see my screen? Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, if I'm going too fast, um, please do grab my attention. Um, feel free to unmute um, for org organizers or co-hosts um, to say if I'm either going too fast or, um, yeah, are otherwise trailing off on a tangent and if I'm going over time. Um, so this is a uh, quick presentation um, around diversity and inclusion. Um, so before I start, I just wanted to mention, um, my name is Piv Kapalasingham, my pronouns are he and him, and I'm a scientific training officer at uh, the European Bioinformatics Institute um, in a training team um, based in the UK, in Cambridge. And if you do want my email address, it's just there, piv at evi.ac.uk. So, very simple today. I'm going to be introducing the definitions of equality, diversity, and inclusion, and then going into a few things you can do to support diversity and inclusion in your work within OLS and beyond. So no doubt you might have seen this graphic before. I think it's a fantastic graphic. It's a way to kind of conceptualize um, how inequality, equality, equity, justice uh, can work and can be described. So if we look at the top left, um, inequality, is essentially the unequal access to opportunities. And this is shown by a tree that is leaning over to one side and there's uh, two people here and one is getting the apples and I guess being very happy about it and the other is wondering why they haven't got any apples. So this is what inequality conceptually can look like. Um, equality would be the, evenly, the even distribution of tools and assistance to be able to get um, things. So such as um, in this case, it'd be showing that each person would get uh, the same sized ladder for a tree, even though the tree is bending to one side. Um, so this still means that even though you've provided kind of equal tools and they've been evenly distributed, one uh, person can still use this tool to then reach the thing they want, in this case, the apple, and the other still cannot gain access to uh, the thing they need, in this case, the apple. So what does equity look like? And I think equity is the word that I really would prefer to be used in this kind of space. And I think is generally accepted in the equality, diversity, or equity, diversion, diversity and inclusion space to be used. Um, equity is where custom tools are identified and then used to address inequality. Um, so in this case, instead of a uh, ladder of the same size being provided to each person, it would be one ladder uh, suitable for one person and then a taller ladder uh, suitable for another. And in this way, both can then gain access to the same thing. And finally, we have justice. And this is kind of the end goal, I guess, of what we're trying to do here. Um, if we want a justice, uh, we want equity then to be weaved into all parts of society. Uh, justice is then the system itself being fixed. So in this case, the tree uh, in the last three um, diagrams was bending to one side. And we're seeing here that justice actually fixes the tree itself so that both can then use the tools that are given to them to then access the same thing. And I think that is something that we can um, basically weave into our work. And I'll be mentioning a couple of things we can do in that regard. And if you do want to learn more, then you can um, think about going to the Addressing Imbalance uh, section by Tony Ruth. So a bit more about diversity and inclusion. So diversity would be basically the fair representation of various identities and differences. Now, in the UK, uh, there are at least seven, and it can be expanded even more. So at least for um, kind of UK law, there are um, a number of protected characteristics. So this would be age, disability, uh, gender reassignment, uh, marriage, civil partnership, pregnancy, maternity, um, race, religion, belief, sex, and sexual orientation. Um, and this is essentially what we're talking about in terms of diversity, just being able to include all these groups or have them as part of the discussion, they're being visible. Now, equity, as mentioned, is focusing on fair treatment, equal opportunity, and importantly, equal access as well to resources um, for these different groups. 
we do think about inclusion and inclusion is quite a really important one. It's this kind of sense of uh, feeling welcome, the sense that everyone does actually feel like they were part of the process from uh, a necessary point onwards and that they were able to interact uh, evenly on the work they were trying to do and participate towards. So this can be expanded a little bit more in this figure here. So if you see on the top left, exclusion we can see would be um, essentially different groups, diverse groups uh, being essentially excluded from a particular activity or a piece of work. Um, segregation is when there's kind of inclusion from one regard. So you see a few groups included, um, but they're still separated and not really interacting with the kind of majority here. Um, and then we have integration. Integration is where, so they're kind of sort of within the group of the majority, but still kind of segregated within um, the majority. So it's far less likely that you'll see these kind of diverse groups from different um, characteristics, with different characteristics, actually being involved uh, properly in society. What we really want to gain is uh, inclusion, where everybody is all part of the same system and still being able to equally and equitably interact with everybody and the kind of work and what you kind of want to adjust to society for that. So hopefully that kind of describes kind of inclusion um, as well as equity, diversity. Um, accessibility here is something um, that kind of can support um, kind of protected characteristics. Um, some people do lump um, kind of ideas about equity, diversity and inclusion with accessibility. Um, but just a note here that accessibility um, is slightly different, um, but still a very necessary part of the work that you would do um, on a practical level. So just another way to look at this, um, we can have discussed diversity and equity, inclusion would be the active engagement of the contributions and participation of all people, and diversity asks who is in the room. Equity will be asking who is trying to get in the room but can't, and inclusion is asking has everyone's ideas been heard. Now, this is a paper that came out a couple of years ago, and this is part of a kind of piece um, just around the fact that there's actually a load of research that has found uh, that bias exists in society. It's nothing new. It's been here for a long time. Um, people are doing some good work to kind of un unravel the complexity and sometimes the simplicity of how this kind of stuff happens and how it can be propagated. So I do implore you to kind of go out there and find these resources, these um, kind of publications um, out there that are discussing the issue. So this is a 2020 article, and it was a really uh, interesting article. It's kind of within the sphere of science. Um, it was around the diversity innovation paradox. And um, essentially, this is one quote, uh, they did like, you know, a kind of a study and essentially found that our analyses show that underrepresented groups produce higher rates of scientific novelty. However, their novel contributions are devalued and discounted. For example, novel contributions by gender and racial minorities are taken up by other scholars at lower rates than novel contributions by gender and racial majorities. So I did leave a reference here. I think that, you know, it's definitely something worth uh, kind of looking into and reading. Uh, essentially, it just kind of shows that, um, you know, if you're from an ethnic or racial um, or kind of gender or any other kind of minority group, um, societally it seems that your work is tends to be more novel than average and yet uh, it doesn't get taken up in the same way and this doesn't just go into citations and other metrics it actually turns itself into bigger things such as um, successful academic careers and who tends to be the people who tend to be the people who end up getting to these um, higher echelons of academia so I've talked a little bit about definitions and some of the issues, um, kind of at least within science as well. Um, I'm going to leave you with this. How can you weave diversity and inclusion into your work? Now, there are many, many resources available. I'm providing one such uh, resource here. It's uh, Welcome's Anti-Racist Toolkit that came out about a year and a bit ago. Um, I think it's uh, an excellent piece of work, and there's a reference uh, there that you can look into. Um, but this isn't the only one. You know, race, is, uh, race and ethnicity is only one axis. There's many different axes. And to be inclusive, uh, ultimately, you've got to take this kind of intersectional approach where you think about um, how these different um, kind of characteristics um, can be present in more than one person and can weave and have really different effects in different spaces. Some advice, find allies, uh, which you'll be learning a bit more about, and collaborate, move the needle together, change the dial. Um, 
It's essentially saying that there are different people out there who are willing to work on the same thing and support you and the kind of work you're doing. So find those people and work together. Um, finally, embed diversity and inclusion into as many facets of your work as possible. So safe spaces in meetings, really important thing. It allows people to feel a bit more included and able to kind of bring their whole selves into the workspace and be able to um, interact effectively with everybody else. Um, add as regular agenda items into meetings, uh, diversity and inclusion. So have this as something that isn't just a, a project-based approach that you're never gonna check again. Make sure that you're doing regular checks in agenda items or in projects and make sure that um, you're collecting metrics and then make sure that it is basically being progressed. And if it's not, ask why. And um, finally, kind of a bit more of a reflective piece, do make sure you're asking where are my or our blind spots and who are we leaving behind and then find a way to counteract this kind of work. So those are kind of general principles for um, different characteristics, um, but essentially uh, a lot of the resources are out there. A lot of the communities out there are working actively to do this, and um, I do implore you to have a look. Um, that's all I had to say for the time being. So thank you very much for the information. I'm happy to take questions or uh, move into bits of discussion. Um, thanks again. Well, thank you so much, Beth. This is very enlightening and insightful. Uh, I love what you mentioned about really finding allies and collaborators and yeah, look back to the work that you've been doing. Um, we have uh, a couple of questions within the other bad, but anyone got a question also please feel free to post in the chat or you can unmute yourself uh, so one of the questions is asking about do you know of toolkit about socioeconomic class issues uh, that's a really good question um i do have a couple of book recommendations um on this issue. It's quite a big issue in the UK. Um, and, and I think many, many other countries do um, kind of have this as well. Um, if you give me a moment, I can put those into uh, the etherpad uh, for you. I just need a little poke just in case I forget. Yeah, uh, take your time. I mean, you can you can add it later within the etherpad. Uh, this question coming in is asking when working in a group, how we can best respond to racial microaggression, especially when it comes to superiors. Um, and that's do you have any kind of tips? Yeah, so I think some of this might come up during the ally skills uh, kind of trading for sure. Um, so one idea is um, to go from being a passive bystander to an active bystander. And um, I took some training about a year or so ago. I'm really sorry if this is um, kind of overlapping with the ally skills work, but um, there's this idea about the four Ds. Um, uh, around kind of uh, being an active bystander. Um, and I think this is work that um, Imperial College have um, a good article about this. Um, if you give me two moments, I can find, there we go. So the four Ds are direct, either being direct, uh, distracting, delegating, or delaying. Um, so a lot of people think that when you're an active bystander, the first thing you got to do is just rush into the thing and just immediately call it out and yeah, kind of um, you know, some people might call it something like um, cancel culture, for example, or, you know, being kind of so politically correct. Um, however, there's ways to navigate that space where you are direct, but not being um, kind of aggressive. And essentially, I guess the the fifth D could be something around de-escalation. Um, I see a lot of people in kind of many meeting environments Um you know, we'll use a joke, for example, to kind of, you know, distract away from um, some kind of microaggression and then afterwards approach the person who was um, kind of perpetuating, say, like a like a myth or kind of the, the aggressor, essentially, um, and then having a word with them and saying what might be the next step in terms of trying to correct this um, in way of some kind of apology. Um, so I will put the link into um the chat and i'm again hoping that will probably go into the etherpad i'll definitely have to do that too there you go oh thank you thank you yeah i'll add it to the etherpad uh one last question and something that um comes a lot in open source projects actually um so a lot of people are trying to get representation from diverse group, but, but 
However, by doing that, they sometimes overwork these marginalized identities. And uh, yeah, do you have any tips on how people can actually avoid doing that? Avoiding over uh, working diversity. And so, so would that be the idea of, um, say, like spending too much time and kind of like misrepresenting so, so, the audience ultimately or something? Yeah. Um, so the way I understand that question, I don't know, probably you is the one who uh, did write it, but the way I understand it, for example, we came through this problem within our community. So sometime within open source project, you want to get more contributors coming from really the global south. But um, often you are overworking these people who might not have the privilege and the time to do these kind of things. Uh, and you really overworking these marginalized people. Um, I, I don't know if you want to correct me or. Yeah. I you summed it up perfectly. To... Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah, I just misunderstood the word overwork, I think. Um, I think I was understanding over egg or something. Um, yeah, so that's a really good point. Um, I think where possible, if you are working um, with people from different kind of marginalized uh, groups or people from the global south or from, or from less economically developed countries, LDCs or LMICs, um, I think it's really important to um, have a conversation where people can discuss how much they can contribute to a particular project. Um, I guess it might seem a bit um, ambitious, but I would say if you're if you recognize that you are in a position of power and privilege, um, I think there's an onus on you to be the one to do a lot of the work um, in some shape or form and make it as easy as possible for people um, from marginalized groups to interact and um, yeah, kind of contribute to the open source and kind of open projects. Um, if you have the funds to do so, maybe kind of providing some kind of funds um, can be or any other kind of compensation, recognition, something that is past the idea of just simple exposure um, is an ideal situation. Um, and I guess personally, so I've kind of worked um, kind of with different groups such as this, and I think especially in kind of in areas in the global south, the most important thing you can do is perhaps um, give them access to your networks, for example, um, give them um, kind of some kind of mentoring. Sometimes it's not money that's needed, it's time. And if you're able to support this in uh, individuals in this way or provide some training to them um, for free, for example, or any other resources, um, that could come a long way to then kind of le level the playing field a little bit, uh, make things a bit more equitable. Um, yeah, that's what I would suggest is yeah, what do people think of that? Is that um, suitable or unrealistic for some projects? Because I appreciate there are many different projects out there and sometimes um, that might not work. First of all, I love that. I mean, uh, I like the fact that sometimes not money is the thing that they're looking for, like access to your network, the mentoring, the training, these things are really, really important and precious. But if anyone have anything, they would like to add, uh, probably the cat one add something. <laughs> uh, feel free to unvoice, uh, unmute, sorry. Yeah, um, I, I think one thing just to add to that is, um, yeah, this idea of capacity building. Um, so capacity building or capacity development um, does have a big kind of training aspect to it, um, but isn't just training. So just being able to um, work with people in as equitable a way as possible, um, ensuring that there's kind of true collaboration and not just this idea of kind of helicoptering in. So for example, in research would be helicopter research. Um, yeah, and kind of having an approach that allows people to feel like they're contributing and not just being leached off of, for sure. This is very profound. Thank you so much, Bib. Um, I always learn something new from Bib and all these talks. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if anyone got any more questions or anything or any notes, please do add it within the other part. But for the sake of time, I'm going to now pass it to Paz. Over mm -hmm. to you. Hello. Yep. And just wanted to add that I don't know if you in your countries have this saying. In Chile, we have the, the saying that better to have friends than to have money like you're better off if you have friends than to have 
yeah, and, and we have it very, yeah, there's a lot of wisdom behind. Of course, you need also need money, but if you have to choose, yeah, All right. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna share the the presentation. We have a reflection exercise first. Right. I should open the no open, but uh, yeah, check the other part before. <laughs> it's true. We have a um, okay. So in line uh, eighty eight, go to line eighty eight, and there's a silent uh, reflection. Um, you can add in the pad your comments, your ideas, your suggestions, complaints, or anything. Uh, so the questions that we want you to think of is, uh, the first one is, what's a place that made you feel included uh, the first time you visited or the first time you were in there, online or in person? Uh, and the second is, what made that place so inclusive? What made it good? So. Let's go ahead. We have uh, 10 minutes for that. <laughs> 